Understand the importance of relational wellness. No man is an island. It takes a village to raise a child. Everyone is connected by six degrees. What do all of these quotes have in common besides the fact that you probably have heard them before? They are quite common because there is a tremendous amount of truth to them. Human beings, by and large, are social creatures. Even the most introverted and shy person would at least interact with his or her relatives, or at least has one friend or acquaintance. Truly, asocial people are quite rare. They exist, but they are definitely outliers. Most people need other people. Understand that this is part of who you are and your social relationships and how you function within this interconnected network of human beings directly impact your wellness. In fact, the more you interact with people and the more positive your interactions are, the better off you feel. Indeed, author Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers described a study involving Italian-American immigrants from a town called Rosetto. As I mentioned in the introduction to this training, people from that part of Italy had pretty much the same lifestyle as other Americans. What was different about that population group is their high level of social connection, although they had pretty much the same lifestyle and diets as other demographic groups. When it comes to length and quality of life, they pretty much dominated. This really stumped a lot of epidemiologists. Usually, the standard literature in the United States is that when people groups have the same inputs like diet, environment, and activity levels, among others, they would have the same health outcomes. Not the Rosetto group. It was definitely an outlier. And the secret ingredient, it turned out, was their social relationships. They had this small town, very warm Italian interpersonal connection that ensured nobody fell off the social map. Nobody felt disconnected, alienated, alone in the crowd or lonely. Somehow, some way, there's this social fabric that sustained people in that network and this translated to better mood, psychological states, and life expectancy. Social relationships have a strong impact on overall wellness. Make no mistake about it, there are many parts of the United States and Western Europe that are very well fed when it comes to basic nutrition, security, shelter, and other basic needs, as well as creature comforts. People are well taken care of. Still, their later years, as well as their general quality of life, is not as good as it could be. They suffer from tremendous amount of anxiety that the people are grappling with depression, and this all leads back to the need for connection. Although your most basic needs are taken care of, they don't define completely. There is a lot of other things that are missing. One key element a lot of people suffer from and is missing from their lives is this social interaction. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be some sort of extrovert. This doesn't necessarily involve you having to have this extremely bubbly personality that just loves to meet new people. It doesn't have to be like that. You don't have to go to such lengths. Instead, you just need to be open to sharing with other people and truly caring of what goes on in their lives and vice versa. The sense of connectedness not only makes for more vibrant communities, but it also has a measurable impact on your sense of well-being. You feel complete. You feel like you are part of a larger cause. You don't feel like you're this free-floating person out there that nobody really cares about. This is not just a mental state. This is not just a mood, but it actually has physical consequences. Sadly, we live in a modern age where people pack up, pull up their roots routinely. In fact, it's not uncommon for the typical American family to move at least five times during the childhood of the children in that family. As the parents chase after new career opportunities, it's not uncommon for families to bounce around the continental United States and even to other countries. While there is a tremendous amount of economic benefit to that, it also leads to tremendous emotional and social dislocation. We need to feel connected to the people and to a larger community. And sadly, given how fast our economy is developing, this is not always available and is not always present. The impact of the concept of enough. You have to be mindful of what you think you have going for you. A lot of people are focused on getting more. They think that the answer to everything is just to get more. If you need to get a promotion at work, you just need to do more work, produce more stuff, deliver work with more quality. If you're feeling lonely or disconnected, you normally would think that you just need more friends or need to spend more time with people. If you are not feeling healthy or you are not that happy with the person that you see in the mirror in the morning, you feel that you just need to work out more. It's all the same. More, more, more. But if I told you that this idea of more is dragging you down and holding you back, what if I told you that it's actually grinding you down and putting you in a state of existential paralysis? Maybe the better way to go about doing things is to focus on the concept of enough. You have to understand when people say, I have to do more, I have to get more. I have to be more. They often chase shadows. They often chase vague concepts that are not of their making. 
Oftentimes, they view it on metrics that are very alien to their life. Oftentimes, they are involving other people's expectations. This may be social expectations. This may be family obligations, whatever the case may be. They end up using a ruler, so to speak, set by other people often very distant from them. This is a problem. When you set up these standards for yourself, you think that your life has direction. After all, according to the old saying, to reach the moon, aim for the sun. When you aim high, don't be surprised if you get to a better place. It may not be the ultimate place, but it's definitely much better than where you started. It's easy to understand these, but the problem is when it comes to actually working towards getting more, people end up grinding themselves down. They become victims of their own expectations. They feel like losers and failures because they did not achieve the grand vision, whatever form it takes. Sadly, this destroys a lot of lives, and the worst form of destruction is this low-level feeling that you are a disappointment. This happens all the time because people lose sight of the fact that there is an alternative concept. Instead of looking for the grand things, the big victories, the ultimate achievements in life, why not just focus on enough? That's right, there is such a thing as enough social status, income, wealth. Yes, it's possible to be happy enough. The problem with wanting more is that you eventually become blind to the fact that you will never get there. It is the eternal future. I remember when I was in college and I was living on $20,000 a year for housing, food, you name it. This was, of course, outside of tuition. I was happy as a clam. I and my friends would get together and everybody would bring a cup of instant noodles and I would turn on the hot tap and we would just drink some beers, enjoy our noodles and have a great old time. I met up with the same friends 20 years later and everybody rolls in with their Mercedes Benz, BMWs, people live in gated communities and everybody's bitching and moaning about property taxes, insurance, finding private schools that are worth the money and on and on it goes. It dawned on me that when I was in college, Living on what now seems like a ridiculously insignificant amount of money, I was very happy. I always looked forward to that nice hot bowl of instant noodles that was my breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and guess what? I never got tired of it. I mastered all the flavors that instant noodles came in. It was a delight to switch flavors. But when I moved on after graduation, all of a sudden, my needs changed. Instead of focusing on what I actually needed, it really wasn't that much. I mean, let's get real here. You don't really need that much. You just need a roof over your head people around you not to kill you, food, water, light, and you're good to go. Those needs don't change. Believe me, my needs when I was in that cramped dorm room 20 years ago were the same as my real needs now, but I live in a completely different place. I have three cars. I do many different things with my time, and my world is completely changed. I share this with you because your consumption of need changes with time and changes with your income as well as the opportunities presented to you. It also changes in a very dramatic way based on your social circles. If you hang out with people who belong to country clubs and drive Ferraris and Lamborghinis and Mercedes-Benz vehicles, your concept of need is going to be very different from other groups of people. But one thing is clear, regardless of your concept of need now, is going to be very different from when you were younger. I raise this with you because the constantly wanting more, more, and more is corrosive. As I mentioned earlier in this training, there are many millionaires who kill themselves because they are just absolutely miserable. They are miserable because they are not getting what they think they deserve. They want more. When they cannot attain it, everything else is a failure. Everything else is a complete and unmitigated disaster. I can't even begin to tell you how wrong this is. Just one fact to bring everything into perspective. Please wrap your mind around this statistic. Hundreds of millions of people all over the planet live on less than $2 a day. Let that sink in. Next time you think about your disappointments and not being able to afford the latest BMW sports model, Think about that figure. The next time you worry about having to wait a little bit more to afford a new set of golf clubs, think about that figure. You have to understand that there's a big difference between what you really need and what you want. And unfortunately, people make themselves unnecessarily miserable when they confuse the two. As I mentioned above, your needs have hardly changed. The only thing different between myself now and who I was 20 years ago is the fact that I now have a wife and a kid. That's pretty much it fundamentally. Now, my income has changed. What I do for a living changed. My surroundings have changed. I drive cars now, but fundamentally, and I'm talking about me as a person, the only change really is me becoming a parent and a husband. Focus on your fundamental identity when trying to define your needs, because if you can't figure this out, you're going to be doing what everybody else is doing. They are confusing their needs and their wants. Their wants start to look like needs. This is going to be a problem because your wants are all about more, more, more. The antidote, focus on enough. 
When you focus on the concept of enough, you allow yourself to be dragged back, pulled back, and cemented to the concept of need. Again, you really don't need all that much. You need shelter, safety, clean air, sunlight, food, water, rest. You know, the basics. And the more you shave off a lot of the unnecessary stuff and focus on what is enough, the saner and healthier you will be. I raise this issue here because oftentimes our needs are influenced by our social settings. Like I mentioned earlier, the needs of a working class person are going to be different from those of a middle class or an upper class person. It's time to question the impact of your social setting on your needs. If your desire to get more and more and more is dragging you down, making you feel miserable, you might want to start deconstructing your needs and rediscover the concept of enough. You might want to question if it's really all that wise to absorb on a wholesale basis everybody else's expectations as well as definitions of need. This is going to be tough because a lot of people would say that you're lowering your standards. You are not living up to your full potential. They'll say a million things to you to make you feel lousy. But the bottom line is you have to do something that makes sense to you. You can't kill yourself based on other people's definitions and values. That's not going to work, and unfortunately, it happens all the time. Just because you live in a gated community with well-manicured lawns and amazing golf courses, everybody drives around in luxury cars, doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do the same. What you choose to drive, how you choose to live, must make sense to you, and the concept of enough must be part of this. Relational Dysfunction So what could possibly go wrong when you are suffering from a breakdown of a relational wellness? Here's just a partial list. The actual list can be quite long, but these are the most familiar. Quarter midlife crisis. Did you just graduate from college or graduate school? Or have you been working for 20 years and you feel like you hit a wall? You may have a well-paying job or you may be jobless. It doesn't matter. If you are in this place, you are questioning your decisions. You're asking yourself, where do I go from here? Did I make the right choices? What should I be doing for a living? Is my career helping me blossom as a person? Do the things I do for a living really make me happy? Do they bring me the kind of fulfillment that I truly desire? These are serious questions, and unfortunately, the idea of a midlife crisis doesn't just apply to people in their 40s and 50s. In fact, a lot of millennials starting at the age of 16 onwards are feeling the same symptoms. They have this tremendous angst about who they are, what they do for a living, what they should do for a living, what things are worth doing. And on and on it goes. And a lot of this can be traced to relational dysfunction. A lot of this can be traced to whose standards are we using to measure success and purpose. Are we shooting for more, more, and more? Have you forgotten about enough? Antisocial behavior. A lot of people simply just break down due to lack of meaningful relational connections. This does not mean that they actively seek to harm others. This does not mean that they are serial killers or criminals by any stretch of the imagination. Instead, they become so self-absorbed that their self-regard and self-concern become sort of emotional black hole. They find it very hard to care about people because they have a tough time convincing themselves that they themselves matter. This is a really tough place to be in. We have to understand that for somebody to say something hurtful, it has to come from someplace. People who consistently spout out negativity that corrodes other people are themselves hurting. It really all boils down to, if I'm going through hell, why shouldn't you? Bad stuff. Lack of contentment. Even when things seem to be going well on many fronts in your life, it's still easy to find yourself feeling inadequate. You can't quite put your finger on it, but something is missing. You may be confident enough in your abilities, but you just can't find it in you to be truly happy. You can't quite accept everything as it is and let it go. There's just something free-floating that feels to complete your experience. A lot of this can be traced to relational dysfunction. Either you are using standards that do not make sense in the specific context of your life, or you're scared to explore what else is out there. Lack of contentment is very troublesome to a lot of people because different people deal with it in different ways. Others feel sad, so it's really hard for them to feel happy, not just for themselves, but for other people. Others deal with lack of contentment by making other people miserable. They are very critical. They're picky. They always try to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. They're always looking at the flaw of what would otherwise be an amazingly beautiful diamond. Others deal with lack of contentment by being very proud to the point of being obnoxious. They know deep down inside that they are not really all that happy, so they project this imaginary perfect life. You probably have seen some of these people on your Facebook timeline. There are many other ways people deal with lack of contentment. Make sure you recognize it and understand that it can trace back to dysfunctions and how you relate with people. Interpersonal Conflict a lot of people have a tough time realizing that they love their fathers or mothers. A lot of people have traumas from their past. 
Maybe that their dad wasn't around physically because he was so busy trying to put food on the table. Maybe their mother was too protective and shielded them from lessons that they needed to learn. Sure, these lessons are hard and oftentimes uncomfortable, but they need to go through this. So they grew up with a tremendous amount of conflict and resentment. This, of course, is manifested in interpersonal conflicts if you see your father in everybody or you've tried to find your mother in everybody. Similarly, if interpersonal conflicts take the form of being needy and holding people to such high standards that you yourself don't want to live up to, not only is this hypocritical, it's also downright annoying, self-blame, and emotional self-abuse. On the other end of the spectrum are people who express relational dysfunction by consistently whipping themselves into a frenzy. If everything goes wrong, they are at fault. There might not be any logical or rational connection between the perceived problem or failure and in their actions, but they'll find one or make one up. The conclusion is always the same. They are the problem. They emotionally abuse themselves, and this is very toxic. Not only leads to depression and possible suicidal ideas, but it positions people to become emotional doormats. Let me tell you, if you do not respect yourself, don't expect others to do it for you. There are very bad people out there that are actually looking for people who suffer from emotional self-abuse. You think they'll embrace you with wide open arms and comfort you and give you the things that you were missing. Absolutely not. They may talk that way, but what they'll do is actually use you, exploit you, and yes, abuse you worse than you abuse yourself. Be very careful. Understand that what you're suffering from flows from relational dysfunction. The way you define your personhood in the context of everybody else around you needs work. Otherwise, you wouldn't be always blaming yourself. Thankfully, relational wellness can be achieved. For more free educational content, visit learnforfree.biz. Content produced and distributed by AllSuperInfo.